In our previous videos on the gas laws, we have just finished learning of the existence of the ideal gas law, which given the conditions we can measure for a gas of pressure, temperature, amount, specifically in a moles, or volume, if we're given any three of these four combinations, we can use the ideal gas law to determine the fourth condition. However, there are some very important uses of the gas law that extend beyond just doing that simple function. The first would be in stoichiometry of gases, how we can actually find molar amounts so that we can use coefficients stoichiometrically to get molar amounts of other gases. Uh, it's also important that we know how to use the ideal gas law if we wish to determine the molar mass of an unknown gas. And it also has tremendous utility in determining the densities of gases at different conditions. And let's go ahead and start with an example of a density problem. This problem says, what is the density of carbon dioxide at 20 degrees C and two atmospheres of pressure? Well, the first thing I would want to do is write down the things that are not stated in the problem. Yes, we have a temperature of 293 kelvins and a pressure of two atmospheres. But the very fact that we're told we have carbon dioxide means, of course, that we have a molar mass, 44.0 grams per mole. So I like to have that in front of me when I go to do the problem. And of course, because it's a gas, we have the omnipresent gas law constant, 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So these are all the values associated with this particular problem. And I'm asked for a density. And we know that a density is little more than a mass to volume ratio for anything, including this gas. So of course, I'm going to start with the answer. I'm going to create a mass over volume ratio. Well, looking through all my data, the only place where I see a mass is right here, the molar mass. So I'm going to use that to begin the problem. 44 grams per one mole. But that doesn't account for the volume part that I need, too. It accounts for the mass part that I need. But to account for the volume part in the denominator, I will need a volume. And of course, the only place I see units of volume are in my ideal gas law constant. So of course, I'd like to invert this and get the liters down here in my expression. In other words, there are 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, just as there is a mole Kelvin per every 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres. Now look what happens. First of all, our moles cancel. And we have essentially constructed the beginnings of a density. We have a mass to volume ratio. However, there are two quantities we don't want. We don't wish to have a temperature, and we don't wish to have units of pressure. So I need to cancel those. And that's very simple, because I was given a temperature, which if I divide by, will cancel the temperature. And I'm given a pressure, which if I multiply by, the atmospheres cancel, leaving me with a ratio of mass to volume, mass over volume. In other words, we have 3.66 grams per liter of volume. And yes, that's not a very great density. Picture how large a liter is, a thousand milliliters. And then consider how small a mass this is. And this confirms what we've been learning all along about gases. Namely, they are not very dense, typically. At least not at these fairly low conditions of temperature and pressure. Now, we can also use some information to calculate molar masses. And this is very important if you wish to identify the molecular formula for an unknown gas. You would, of course, need an empirical formula that you could get experimentally. But then you would also need a molar mass to get a molecular formula. So how can we get a molar mass out of this information? We know that we have a gas, 
and we know its density. That's a mass to volume ratio. And we're given a pressure and we're given a temperature. But because it's a gas, we can automatically assume we have at our disposal 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, the omnipresent gas law constant. And since I find it easiest to do problems by starting with the answer, if I want a molar mass, I'm looking for a ratio of mass to moles. And with the data given here, I can construct that ratio. First of all, I would need a mass. And here in my density are units of mass. So I would start with my density written such that the mass is in the numerator, like I would like it to be for a molar mass. And then, since I haven't completely started with the answer, I'd like to start with moles in the denominator. And a temperature and a pressure are not moles, but moles are part of my ideal gas law constant. So I will multiply by 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And now I am essentially starting with the answer, a mass to mole ratio, a molar mass. When I do this, the liters automatically cancel. And to obtain my molar mass, I need only cancel the temperature and the pressure. Well, I was given a temperature of 303 kelvins. And so by multiplying by those 303 kelvins, the temperature units cancel from the numerator and the denominator of the expression. Of course, I was given my pressure in millimeters of mercury, not atmospheres. So I would first convert my atmospheres to millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. And the atmospheres, atmospheres cancel and are replaced with millimeters of mercury, which I can then cancel by dividing by the 500 millimeters of mercury I've been given. And that leaves me with the answer of 57.9 grams per mole. So yes, once again, using the ideal gas law constant with a gas, I can create a very important molar mass. So for instance, if I knew that this particular substance that I was looking at had an empirical formula of C2H5, which has an empirical mass of 29 atomic mass units, well, if the molecule had a molar mass of twice that, 58 atomic mass units, I'd be able to then write the molecular formula, C4H10. So it's very useful for unknown substances <coughs> to be able to determine their molar masses. And we've done this for quite a few substances, too, if they're fairly volatile, by actually converting a large amount of the substance to its gaseous form so that we can make these measurements of density, temperature, and pressure. Now, perhaps the most commonly used use of the ideal gas law constant is in stoichiometry. And here we have a problem. When 30 liters of methane at 20 degrees C in two atmospheres of pressure are burned in excess oxygen, if the carbon dioxide produced is collected, what will be its pressure? So of course, I need a balanced equation to begin with. Methane plus oxygen always results in CO2 and H2O production. And of course, with the four hydrogens, we would have two water molecules, one carbon, one CO2. And with a total of four oxygens on the right side of the expression, we would need two oxygen molecules. So if I'm giving you methane and asking about carbon dioxide, a product, I can see the stoichiometric ratio simply one to one. But we have to use moles when we do stoichiometry. And so, of course, we have to start with moles. This is a volume. This is a temperature. This is a pressure. And of course, the ideal gas law also includes moles. So I would start with it by inverting it, turning it upside down, and starting with moles. There is a mole kelvin of 
B of methane for every liter atmosphere of it um, given. So this is how many moles of methane I'm starting with. Of course, I have to cancel the volume, pressure, and temperature of methane. Now, 30 liters was the given volume of methane. Volumes cancel. Two atmospheres was the given pressure of methane. And the temperature was 20 degrees C, otherwise known as 293 kelvins. And all this is is using my ideal gas law to convert conditions of temperature, pressure, and volume to moles. And now I can do stoichiometry because this is moles of methane. So the rest of the, my stoichiometry is how I've always done it. Excuse me, change into pen. Namely, I use the balance equation stoichiometric ratio to go from methane to carbon dioxide. And it's one to one. One mole of methane produces one mole of CO2. Cancel, cancel. And we have moles of CO2. But I didn't ask how much CO2 would be produced. I asked what will its pressure be? So again, I'm going to have to convert moles to a pressure, which is why the ideal gas law constant is once again to the rescue. Because moles and volume in this constant are, of course, in the numerator and denominator, as are moles and pressure. So you see I'll be able to cancel moles and replace it with pressure by using this gas law constant. 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin of CO2. And the moles of CO2 cancel and give me a pressure, but of course I have to cancel everything. I want to cancel the volume and temperature, and I was given a volume, 40 liters, and a temperature, 303 kelvins. Kelvins cancel, liters cancel, and I have successfully found the atmospheric pressure of the product. The only part of this that was in fact stoichiometry is this part right here, using the one to one ratio from the equation. This was just a fancy way to convert to moles, and this was a fancy way to convert the moles we got back to a pressure. So it's really just stoichiometry using moles, but the ideal gas law is what allows us to obtain those moles, and it's also what allows us to turn those moles into a pressure, or a temperature, or a volume on the other end. So these are the most important uses to chemists of the ideal gas law.